Good morning. My name is John Coyville and I'm senior gemologist at GIA. And this session is on the treatment of corundums. And it's becoming a greater and greater problem spotting treatments and uh, being able to understand what's being done. Because literally anything anyone can conceivably think of to do seems to be being done at this time. And they continually come up with new things that surprise us and things that we haven't observed before. So we have to sort of uh, stay on our toes and test stones any way possible to try to separate and to try to distinguish whether or not a stone has been treated. Some treatments are more permanent than others. Uh, common heat treatment where the necessary um, uh, chromophores are already present in the material and all you need to do is mobilize them with heat a little bit. Uh, this type of heat treatment seems to be permanent. Some heat treatments are less permanent, for instance diffusion treatment where they just very lightly diffuse a, a a certain amount of particular type of chemical into the surface. It only goes into a very, very slight degree. And this type of a treatment is less uh, permanent uh, because every time you polish the stone, you remove a little bit of this and eventually end up with the stone back the same color. Uh, other types of treatment, oiling, dyeing, and so forth, these are not particularly permanent at all. And uh, they also have a tendency to look, uh, if, you, if you, over a period of time, they deteriorate and the stone doesn't look like very much. And uh, so consequently, you have to be able to disclose these if you can. You have to be able to spot how this has been done, uh, understand why it's being done, and be aware of it. Because uh, if you're not, then you will be paying a premium price for a stone that you shouldn't be paying a premium price for. Because there still is a distinction or distinctions between the stones that we find that come out of the ground as essentially what we would consider to be perfect gemstones and those which are treated to... Um, emulate those particular types of stones. So what I'll do now is to start this slide program, which is what it is, a slide lecture, explain all these different types of treatments that are being done on corundums to you. And if you have any questions along the way, you know, feel free to ask uh, if anything pops into your mind. So we'll get the lights here and start the slides. Let's see, get the projector going. The program is titled Heat Treating Ruby and Sapphire, but in addition to heat treating, which is the most prominent type of treating, we also have the other types that we will discuss and the other things that are being done. Two types, basically, of heat treatment that we have are diffusion treatment and uh, common heat treatment. Diffusion treatment starts out with pre-cut stones. They can be faceted stones like this, or they can be cabochons. And what they try to literally do is they will take a pale colored stone, one that has uh, a low body in intensity of body color, and they will enhance it by inducing chemicals into the surface that act as chromophores and create a more, much more intense color appearance in the, in the particular stone. So you may start out with very pale blue stones like these, uh, pale purple stone, pale pink stones, or pale yellow stones, and improve on those colors by adding the proper chemical agents. Another way of um, color enhancement is to uh, take a, pre a stone, a crystal, that has all of the necessary chemical elements in it internally already in existence. The only thing you have to do is heat the stone up near the melting point, cause those ions to mobilize. Uh, in the case of stones such as this, they, they refer to them as gouda. Uh, they say they have a color sometimes of diesel oil and so forth. And in the case of stones like this, they're full of all of the necessary chemical constituents. They have the titanium oxide present in the form of rutile, and the titanium oxide that's present is usually heavily laden with iron. So they have all the necessary things to produce a blue stone, the iron and the titanium. All they have to do is mobilize this by heating it. So they heat it above the melting point of the, of the rutile, and uh, the ions are mobilized. They find the proper color center locations, and you end up with a blue stone. Some people equate this to uh, doing what, taking nature's work a step further. That's one way of looking at it, I suppose. Uh, the barrels that are used for this common kind of heat treatment generally 
Now they're using, some people are using more sophisticated furnaces for a little lower temperature work, but the barrels generally used are 55 gallon drums, um, old oil drums and so forth, lined with fire brick. They put a charcoal, uh, a, uh, they get a charcoal fire going using something, some sort of an organic uh, uh, solution, anything from aviation fuel all the way down to diesel fuel and so forth. Once they get this charcoal fire going, the way they generally time these things is when the charcoal burns out, the stones are ready. And you'll notice, you've, re you've probably read in some of the literature that they use temperatures like 1600, you've, heard, you've read 1600 degrees centigrade, uh, 1500 degrees centigrade, 1700 degrees centigrade. You'd be waiting if, uh, until your hair was down around the floor and you were dying of old age before anything would happen at 1600 degrees centigrade in most of these situations. The reason being is that uh, everything on the face of this earth, irregardless of what it is, has what we call a coefficient of volumetric expansion. Uh, that means that as you apply heat to something, it expands. It actually grows in length and in width and so forth, in volume. And uh, so you take something like a ruby, for instance, or a sapphire, and you start to heat it up. It starts to expand. At one point, you get so much heat in there that the bonds are so expanded, they literally break down. That's melting. But if you get as close to that melting point as you can without breaking those bonds, what you have is the lattice expanded to maximum. This gives you the most room for ions to, to migrate. And some ions are just too big to migrate at 1600 degrees centigrade. Titanium's one of them. But at these higher elevated temperatures up near the melting point, they can move around. And when, they, and when you do expand the lattice properly in a condition where you are actually near the melting point, they are free to move about and they do find the proper color center sites and you do get a color enhancement. The same thing is true with diffusion treatment. So both common heat treatment and diffusion treatment require very high temperatures. And you see this, a nice alumina crucible. Alumina is aluminum oxide in a centered form. It melts at a little bit lower temperature than crystalline corundum, single crystal corundum. It melts at about 1910 degrees and uh, starts to break down. And you sleeve this in a coke crucible and you'll see that all these little bits of sapphires are still stuck on the inside. If you look closer at this, you'll see that the crucibles actually started to melt. That's a sign of a very high melting temperature. And bits of the sapphires are stuck in there. And we also see evidence of this on the surfaces of the stones because some of the stones are in more intense area of heat and they actually show evidence of melting on their surfaces. An exaggerated diagram of a um, diffusion treated sapphire. You'll notice that the facet junctions are enhanced and so forth all around paler color in the facets themselves, and this is, it shows the thickness of the layer. Actually, the thickness of the layer is nowhere near like this in a diffusion-treated stone. It isn't even as thick as this first primary black line around here. It's just a very superficial thing, and because the material comes out centered and pockmarked, you have to repolish. When you do that, a lot of times you remove a lot of the color from most of the, of the main facets and just leave the, the facet junctions uh, with color. Even though the facet junctions are polished, there's a reason for them having more color around the edge than there are the lo long flat surfaces. And this is the reason why. This is the diffusion mechanism, basically. What you have is a direction of convection current melt flow. It may go this way, it may go this way, it may swirl around. But every time you have a long flat face, you have a surface of low energy and shallow color penetration because of that. There's no real driving force pushing it down this way. But when you hit a corner and this convection current pulls over the corner, you get a dumping zone, a zone of high energy and a deeper color penetration at all the corners and edges. That's why when you repolish some of these things, you remove the color from the table and from the crown facets, the pavilion facets, and you end up with an enhanced um, outline of the stone. There are other reasons for this as well. One of them is the charge of the ion, uh, which has to be, we're, we're doing a substituting aluminum, or, or not aluminum, but titanium, iron, chromium, or whatever, for aluminum. So the charge has to be the same, it has to balance. In addition to that, you have to have a near ionic radius or the same general size of an ion. You'll notice that aluminum is of a particular size and all of these ions are fairly close in size to aluminum, so they can substitute. But look at the size of titanium, it's a much larger ion uh, to a certain degree, so the lattice has to be a little bit more expanded for titanium to migrate. The other thing we have to think about in diffusion treatment and in, and in heat treatment in general is the direction that the ions will migrate, and particularly in diffusion treatment, because some facets will take, depending on their orientation to the underlying structure, will take color in a uh, more profound way than others. So you'll have deeper color penetration in some directions. You'll look, if you look at the structural diagram here, you'll see you're looking down the C-axis direction when you look at this diagram. And these zones here are open areas where ions can migrate easily. If you're looking perpendicular to the C-axis direction, you'll find that there are 
less open areas, areas actually. And as you rotate a structure, a three-dimensional structure, you'll find out that there's some areas where color penetration would be very shallow, if at all. Example of what diffusion treatment does. And you can think of it as a whole series of, um, like, uh, billiard balls. If the ions traveling around this, the chemical uh, constituents creating the diffusion treatment are like billiard balls. The first one bounces in and penetrates slightly. Another one hammers it in a little deeper. Pretty soon you have a whole line of these things going in. And they're fighting against the basic laws of thermodynamics after a while. So the first initial eight-hour period, you have the primary amount of color penetration. If you let it go for years after that, you wouldn't get very much more. Uh, because the ions would be fighting one another to get into the surface. So what you basically get is in a short period of time you get a shallow penetration of color and so when you do repolish what you end up with is, is facets that are enhanced like this because the color has been removed and in facet junctions in the outline of the stone is more prominent. And this shows the two stones together. A diffusion treated stone right here, very prominent outline, very prominent facet junctions versus a natural stone in immersion in, in methylene iodide. And here you see the girdle outline is just about invisible. You can't see any of the facet junctions. And the color zoning is very, very prominently in one direction. Whereas this is, seems to be very even, a very pastel overall effect. And you can easily see the outline of the stone. Other things to look for in diffusion treatment in particular are uh, look along the girdle of the stone and you'll see color concentrations around the edges of the dumping zones where the, there's less polishing. Uh, the color is not removed along these zones as readily as it is off of the primary faces. Also find in pits and in cracks and so forth that the color concentrates down in these because when you are repolishing, you don't reach down into a pit or crack. So you'll find that the color intensity is greater in those areas. Evidence of repolishing or of lack of repolishing in this case. Uh, they hit most of the facets. They missed one of the melt one one that had a very melted appearance to it. And under reflected light, you could catch the idea and the appearance that this is very very melted looking, has a flow appearance to it. In general, in in studying inclusions in gems, uh, heat treated stones, you have to take into account the melting point of the various minerals that may be found as inclusions. This is only a partial list. Uh, by no means is anywhere near complete. But you can see, for instance, uh, all of the, the uh, a primary inclusion rutile, 1850. So if, you're, if you know that rutile has been melted, you know that you're at least above that melting point. Uh, calcite melts at a much lower temperature. Feldspar is at a much lower temperature. These things are all found in uh, corundums. And then here we have corundum at 2050 degrees. You'll notice that spinel and zircon melt at a higher temperature, so they're not likely going, they're not going to melt in a heat treatment of corundum. A rutile meltdown that takes place. You've all seen Sri Lankan stones that haven't been heat treated, I hope, where they have the nice long needles in them and so forth. And you've seen the Burmese stones with the, with the nice stout little needles in there. You've probably also seen stones with all these little dotted lines, you know, sort of conforming to the general configuration of a corundum, uh, of the rutil in a corundum. But they are made out of all these little dotted uh, little entities laying in the original pattern. And what happens here, if you can imagine a glass rod laying out on this table surface, a long glass, for instance, and you were able to heat that up to the melting point, you would find that that glass would not coalesce into one globule. What it would do is it would break up into individual little droplets along that line. The same thing happens with the rutile here. And as the lattice expands against the rutile, these little individual droplets can be reabsorbed from where they came from originally back into the, into the crystal in a, in a uh, metastable solid solution phase. And... Uh, what can happen in this case is that you could anneal this and keep the rutil from precipitating back out. And then if some jeweler came along at a later point in time, heated this above the melting point of the, of the rutil and didn't allow an annealing time, what you would end up with is the rutil coming back out of solid solution and the stone would be clouded again by it. So they use this technique sometimes to clarify stones and also to improve stars occasionally because they can diffuse the titanium into the surface, improve the leg on a star, the general appearance of it. Here you see the rutile before melting, nice long needles, unbroken. And then after melting, this is a kind of an effect you get, all these little dots. And this is one of the things that you've... Recently, there seems to be a rash of, of, of cashmere sapphires on the market. And all it is, really, is these ones with these little tiny Tyndall scattering rutile particles that are broken up, you know, and they give it this milky look, and they call it a cashmere stone. It's not that cashmere is being mined anymore, it's just that people are mistaking these things for true cashmere sapphires and a diffusion-treated sapphire, uh, improving the star. You get a diffusion star on the surface of this. And it makes a uh, 
it gives an interesting effect, but you can also see that some of the leg didn't take very well here, and we see some sidestepping and so forth in these things. It's interesting. Another mechanism. Uh, this occurs in both blue sapphires and also in uh, the orange ones. And one of the mechanisms that they talked about in the orange ones have been written up is that uh, it's a charge transfer involving iron and so forth, and that the iron is the coloring agent. Well, there's no question that iron is the coloring agent in an orangish um, yellow sapphire, and that blue is a combination of titanium and iron. But where the iron comes from is a questionable thing, and they're not sure. They figured that maybe it was just submicroscopic um, iron already present in the system and uh, a little bit of heat caused it to, to migrate into color centers and that's where it came from. But a little bit closer examination of some of these stones, you'll find out that they have little tiny needles and groups of needles in them and so forth. If you look down the end of them, you see the little dots. If you look along the side, you see this. And if you study them very closely in diffused transmitted light or under immersion, you'll see that they have a, almost a hot dog shape if you're looking from the side or a circular ring around them of color. And this is telling you immediately that the color the coloring agents are coming from the inclusions. In the case of these, these would be um, primarily iron oxide, needles of iron oxide or a hydroxide, possibly an ilmenite, something like this, maybe a little titanium in them, but more likely a, a um, needle form of hematite. And you see this example here uh, with all these little dots in here. We're looking down the end of them now. And if you put this under immersion after heating it, this is the kind of an effect you get. And you know that the color is definitely coming from these. And if you were to rotate the stone, you would see that it was pockmarked with all, a lot of these little things all over the place, adding color to the stone. You look around these and you see that there isn't much color in the rest of the stone. It's the inclusions that are supplying the coloring agents. And here's an example of a Montana stone that's been heated. This was heated in Thailand. Uh, these inclusions are a uh, ilmenite, which is an iron titanium oxide. You have iron and titanium together, you get blue. So you've got a nice blue ring around each one of these things. They're being cannibalized for their color. You've heard um, that Montana stones are not heat treated, right? Well, it depends on the locality in Montana. Yogo stones are not heat treated. I have to always make this cl clarify this. Yogo stones are not heat treated because there's no reason to heat treat them. They come out of the ground in a variety of hues, everything from a intense, almost a purplish pink, sometimes red, all the way to a, through a color change material, all the way to a nice, beautiful blue. And there's no reason to heat yogo stones, so no yogo stones are not heat treated. Why waste the time? But if you go a little bit further east, you come to the Phillipsburg area, Missouri River, you get an alluvial type of a corundum out, a lot of pastel colors with a lot of uh, disseminated what appears to be rutile in there and so forth, ilmenite. And they figure, why not give these a shot and see what they can do? And that's what this is, is one of these Phillipsburg ones. Another example of a Phillipsburg stone right here, a little color concentration around these inclusions. And they're trying to improve the color and they're cannibalizing the inclusions to do it. Okay, anatomy of a discoid fracture. When you see these things that have been called snowball inclusions and planet Saturn and everything else, we know that the planet Saturn doesn't, inclu doesn't occur as inclusions in gemstones. <laughs> so somebody is looking at something, they don't really know what it is or how to understand it, so they call it the planet Saturn because it's a good way of communicating it to the next person. But what the planet Saturn actually is in these cases is you have a primary inclusion. And that primary inclusion has a melting point below what you're going to heat the corundum at, so it melts. And when it melts, it becomes a liquid. And when it becomes a liquid, it starts to immediately expand very swiftly. It creates a tension situation. The tension is relieved when it fractures, and you get a zone of secondary melting or spillage of what this inclusion was originally made out of in this zone, and it recrystallizes. Then the, the, but the pressure isn't relieved completely, and you get a fracturing that takes place around this, which can be very glassy looking. In fact, it is, unless it's started to heal at the edge, and you may get an early stage healing rind around the outside. It may or may not be present example of one of these. Looks like a square snowball here, probably a feldspar crystal originally. And the late stage healing rind, or the early stage healing rind around the outside, the glassy fracture, and then the melt zone surrounding that. Depending on what the inclusion is and what its melting point is and what the heat temperature was, it, the treatment will depend on how these things look. You also get material, this is a case of a zircon in an Australian stone that was heated, and you'll get you, because we saw it, zircon doesn't melt at the same, it melts at a higher temperature than corundum, you're not going to melt zircon in a heat treatment of a corundum. All it's going to do is thermally expand and fracture. So you don't have any secondary, you don't have any melted appearance here. It's got a nice, nice crystal faces on it. You don't have any secondary melt zone around there, and you don't have any healing rind on the outside because nothing leaked in there to help mobilize the ions. The same thing here. You get a black spinel crystal, melts at a higher temperature. Uh, it uh, only has a fracture around it. There's no uh, snowball-like appearance and so forth. 
And depending on the zone that the material are in, you can even see the little dots of ruteal in here, the milky appearance. But depending on the zone that these things are in, the, the heat will be more or less intense in a particular area. So in some places you'll see actually zonations of color or of, of, of effect, where you'll get a snowball with a halo around it. In one place you just get a little snowball where it just melted. And so you can get clouds and groups of these things depending on the temperature and the gradient of the, of the heat. And this is just a typical example. And since I've been working with inclusions in stones for over 23 years, I've noticed that in the material that I got years and years ago, I didn't see any of this. And then over about the last 15 years, you started seeing this kind of a thing occurring. And so you can sort of begin to pinpoint where something like this started to happen and exactly when. And it's interesting to note that treatments like diffusion treatment in this latest glass filling and so forth, uh, all of these things are earlier patents, believe it or not. In a book called Synthetic Gem Production Techniques and an earlier book called Synthetic Gem and Allied Crystal Manufacture by a company called Noise Data Corporation, they publish all these patents on what's being done to gem materials and so forth and where you can get the patents and all this type of thing. And all these things. I and mean, when this glass filling came out on the market, they were trying to figure out what was going on, what were they using and so forth. And uh, when the diffusion treatment came out, um, nobody knew what was going on. All these things were patents right there in the book. You could open it up and anybody could look in this book and immediately know how to do these things because it was all laid out. And what these people are literally using is this book is like a, a treating Bible. What can we do next? Let's find another patent that we can work with, you know. Since it's not patented over here, we can play around with it all we want to. There's another example of a Montana stone. This brings up a point, though, that heat treatment can be done by nature as well. This happens to be a natural glass inclusion because this comes from a melt environment. Here's one with a little bubble. It doesn't break the surface. This one's been cut through, so the bubble is open at the surface. And there's this glassy cavity that looks like it should be open. If you put it in reflected light, and you can begin to see that it doesn't look like it's open at the, sur at the surface here, but it does look like it here because it's darker. If you go into total reflectance, you can now see the glassy area. Natural glass in this case, it hasn't been filled. A gas bubble that's been cut through. This is a sapphire from a melt environment. The same thing occurs in, in rubies from melt environments. We'll see a couple of those. Another example of this, even the glass is partially devitrified, and you've got crystallization taking place. If you look at that in reflected light, you can see the glassy area, the gas bubble still under there. You can even see some of the zones of crystallization from the devitrification in the, in the particular spot. Now this is something we don't see very often, and I talk about this in the Ruby lecture as well, and that is liquid and gaseous carbon dioxide inclusions. Years ago we used to see these things all the time in, in um, all the stones that were coming out of Sri Lanka. Now we don't see them anymore. The reason being they can't survive a heat treatment. So when you do see a fluid inclusion like this, this, these are, by the way, graphite crystals. Every piece I've ever broken open and tested has been graphite, and not hematite. They always have these black crystals in there. And graphite, it makes sense because graphite is, or Sri Lanka is the biggest source of graphite on the face of this earth. So um, you have a gas bubble of, of gaseous CO2, liquid CO2, a very, very fine water rind, but you can't see it in here. Uh, you can't see it in any of them, as a matter of fact. It wets the inside, and it's not really visible. Uh, and what you do is you just heat this up above 88 degrees Fahrenheit or about 32 degrees centigrade. There's a phase change that takes place. And what you end up with is something that looks like this. And then you can cool it down and the bubble reappears and you can take it back and forth and play around with it all you want to. But this was formed at depth in the earth and it's pushing out at us well over 1,000 pounds per square inch. Since we brought it up to the surface of the earth, it's only, we're only pushing back at 14.2 pounds unless we stand on it. And so you've got this this excessive amount of pressure pushing out and essentially no pressure compensating for it uh, because the rock's all been taken away. So what you've created is this, is this explosive environment. And it's just fine as long as you don't play around with heat with it. But as soon as you start putting heat on this, it will blow up. An example of this was an experiment that I did on when I was doing some earlier heat treating experiments. Uh, there's the graphite crystal, there's the bubble right in there, and the rest of it's liquid or gaseous carbon di or liquid carbon dioxide, there's the gas bubble. And just heating this up, the bubble would disappear and so forth. You'd go above that phase transformation temperature. But this is what happens to it, too. It just cannot take the heat. And this went, this went off at well below 1,000 degrees, but I heated it up all the way to about 1,100 degrees centigrade, a little over 1,000 degrees centigrade, and it actually bleached the color because this was the first step in the color enhancement process. But you can see what happens to these. So if you do see one of these inclusions with the bubble that dances around and disappears and so forth, you know you've got an unheat treated natural Sri Lankan stone. And these can things you, also, yeah. Can you explode that stone just working on it? <laughs> oh, yeah. You've got to be aware of these things. Um, actually, I've known someone that put a, not one of, these inclusions occur in virtually everything with the possible exception of diamond. Not necessarily 
All tourmalines from all localities show it, but tourmalines from selected localities can have inclusions like this. And I knew somebody put an aquamarine in their mouth and uh, from uh, Brazil, and the aquamarine blew up while it was in their mouth. So, yeah, they can be very sensitive, uh, depending on the pressure that they were grown at. The deeper in the earth they grew and under more pressure, the more pressure they have pushing out. So the more sensitive they are to heat. But what the Sri Lankans try to do is cut these things out or the people that are heat treating them, drill into them, some way relieve that pressure before they heat treat. So you can look for these things. You'd be amazed how fascinated people are when you start showing them how animated these things can be. Now, they don't have any idea that anything goes on inside of a gemstone. It's a frozen solid as far as they're concerned. We show them these bubbles disappearing and, and boiling back and so forth. They're fascinated by it. Okay, I did a paper a few years back called um, uh, Induced Fingerprints. And uh, the reason that I did the paper was because back when I was in university, I uh, did some experimentation on quartz and actually produced um, fingerprint inclusions in quartz, in synthetic quartz, and uh, by hydrothermal process. But um, the flux process is essentially the same thing. You're just not using pressure. You're using a different mobilizing, a mineralizer, which is the flux instead of water in a hydrothermal situation. And so the, Kurt Nassau did an article in G&G &G a number of years ago. It was on heat treatment of, ru of rubies and sapphires, technical aspects it was called. And they had process six in there. And process six was induced fingerprints, and it said, big question mark, process unknown. Didn't know how it was being done. So I figured, well, recreate the experiment, only use a flux environment. So I took a flame fusion material, uh, gave it to Tom Chatham, had him grow a quick layer of flux over the top of it. It was pre-fractured. The flux went right into the fractures that were in the flame fusion material, and when it came out, it looked like it, ha it had flux fingerprints in the flame fusion material, and that's how it was being done, mm -hmm. with a fluxing agent introducing it into cracks and allowing it to heal. Because every time you see something like this, it's a repaired fracture. That's all it is, nothing more. It w one time was a fracture. The mineralizer, in, the case, in this case, a flux got in there and repaired it. So now we have uh, Mr. Leck Leitner taking this into a commercial aspect. Remember, he's the one who overgrew barrels hydrothermally, well, now he's taking uh, flame fusion sapphires, in this case, and flame fusion rubies, we'll see one of those, and he is uh, putting them into a flux environment, allowing a flux, flux fingerprints to form in here and cutting stones out of the material. And so this is the product that we're beginning to see. And Bob Kane did an article just a short time ago on this new material, and he's studying some other material. But, but this is the way it's being done. It's, a, it's an overgrowth, literally. And... Uh, Another interesting, heat, another interesting treatment, this is not done by heat. They take a pale yellow Sri Lankan stone like this and they subject it to gamma radiation, a gamma source, cobalt-60 something that will produce a gamma. And this is the effect that you get. Now this is not stable, it fades quickly. You can actually put a match under the stone and watch it fade before your eyes or you can keep it wrapped up and just show it to people trying to sell it and uh, hope that it doesn't fade in front of them. But it's interesting to note that the, in a cancer research institute in, uh, in Sri Lanka, a lot of the equipment that was supposedly radiation equipment that was supposedly used for cancer, supposed to be used for cancer research, was being used to make stones orange. <laughs> so, <laughs> enterprising. But you've got to be careful of those. You, know, you have to subject orange sapphires to fade test. Make sure you're not getting something that's going to, when you get it home, is going to be a different color than when you bought it. Rubies. Usually with rubies, we don't see any great degree of improvement on heat treatment. That's why it's not done as prevalently as sapphires, because we have a tremendous dramatic change in a sapphire and not so in a ruby. So what you get in a ruby, literally, is they try to maybe burn out a, a, bl a bluish overtone or a purplish overtone or a brown overtone, something like this, and make it a more pure red. But in some cases, after the heat treatment, you would literally have had to have cut the stone in half, save one half, heat treat the other half to even see a difference because the percentage of change is so slight in most cases. Diffusion treatment. Uh, we always think of blue sapphires as being the diffusion stones, but this is the very first one we ever saw in, a, in our gem trade lab. And you notice it's not blue. And you'll also notice that in nature, you will never see color confined to a cut facet. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. You know, you see something like that, you know that you're not working with a natural product here. There's something that's happened to this stone. There's no question about it. And this, was by, this wasn't by methylene iodide immersion. We just did this with a facial tissue on the well of the microscope. The other things to look for, basically the same things that you look for in any other kind of a um, treatment process. 
uh, the, uh, the blue sapphires, the orange sapphires, these discoid fractures. If the inclusion melts, you'll get this kind of a fracture with a little halo around the outside, glassy fracture in the middle and the melted crystal appearance. Same thing as in a, as in a um, blue sapphire. Also, um, the needles called boamite, they're the needles that form along twin planes. Uh, what this is, is these needles are an alteration of aluminum oxide, which is the corundum, to aluminum hydroxide, which is the boamite. So it's a different mineral forming along these stress points. And it is, they are stress points, and when you do heat a, a twin stone like this, you'll get these radial-looking wings coming off. The boamite does melt, so you can even get a dotted appearance off of that. And in addition to melting, it will flow slightly into these fracture areas. So you get these wings coming off of those needles. And then a Burmese stone that was heated. You notice what's left of the ruteal here, a whole bunch of little dots. A pock marking on the surface of a ruby. Uh, same thing that you look for in a blue sapphire, an orange sapphire, anything that might have been heat treated. You, if you can find this, if they missed the surface of it, it's proof that it's been treated. Now some of the more common things, and actually some very interesting and clever things, uh, this is just quench crackling. We've all seen that before. Makes it look like it's got fingerprints in it, but something else somebody's doing. This is they're putting chemical dendrites into fractures to make them look more natural. And this had a melting point uh, in the uh, range of a chemical called resorcinol acetanilid. Organic chemicals seem to be used for this because they melt at a low temperature, they flow in, and then they crystallize, giving very natural-looking appearance to the stone. Uh, heat it up with a match and drop it in cold water. If you want, you know, or even hotter than that. No, it depends on how much cracking you want. The hotter you get it, the more it goes to pieces. Okay, this is another example of a chemical dendrite that was induced into a fracture. And the old rusty nail trick. You know, people have always thought in the past that rusty solutions mean it looks natural. I mean, it does look natural. Uh, rusty solution, if it's completely contained within the stone, uh, is, a, is a proof of a natural stone. But if it's not completely contained within the stone, in other words, if it breaks the surface like along here, it could easily be introduced. And the way you can introduce or induce this type of a rusty effect into a stone is just to quench crackle it uh, if you want to, or if it's already got a crack in it, just leave the crack there. Make a rusty nail bath out of uh, some iron filings or something, or some old rusty nails, uh, put it in water, put some salt solution in there with it, get this rusty a colloidal solution forming, and then mix it up just before you're ready to use it. Uh, all you have to do is heat the sapphire or ruby up a little bit, uh, whatever stone it is. Not enough so where you're going to quench crackle it when you put it in the solution, but just enough to rarefy the gases in the fracture so you're creating a vacuum. Then drop it in the solution and it sucks it right in. And uh, when it dries out, if it's got all these rusty particles in there, this is the kind of an effect you get. Now, Crown Ruby's Red Star Ruby Oil, guess what that's used for? <laughs> I'll give you one guess. It's used to oil rubies, and uh, it's red, and it's got a refractive index much lower in ruby. They can improve on that a little bit, but um, they use it to try to hide fractures and to improve the color of the stones, and a lot of stones are, are uh, oiled this way, so it isn't just emeralds that are oiled, but you see what an oiled effect looks like in a fracture. Uh, it's very uh, globular looking, very flowing looking, not like a fingerprint at all. And uh, if you put a hot point near the edge of an oiled stone, you'll find that the oil will sort of run away from it in deeper into the stone if it's out near the edge. This is a terrible job. Look at all the coloring agent in here and so forth. It's an ugly stone. They were trying to improve it a little bit. And even down the drill holes, how many of you have seen these necklaces, these strands of these little tiny beads that look like they're red rubies and they're all strung out and everything like this? Better look closely at those drill holes because they like to put dye right down the hole. It makes the near colorless bead look nice and red. Now we saw that earlier, Lech Leitner Sapphire. This is a ruby grown into, these are flux fingerprints induced into a flame fusion ruby. And uh, it's a process that doesn't take nearly, usually it takes about a year to grow a nice flux crystal, sometimes a little longer than that. To grow one of these things, uh, Tom Chatham did it in 45 days and he has taken pieces of bool large pieces, you can actually, anything you can fit in there, you can overgrow. And uh, so it's a way of making flux material really cheaply. You start with a big seed and use the seed for your cut stone. Okay, here's, here's what you look for, uh, curved striae and also combination of fingerprints and curved striae together in this type of a material with an induced fingerprint. This is the piece I use in the experiment after I cut through it. You'll notice the propagation of the little little cracks like this. They're all filled with flux, make nice little flux fingerprints. 
all through the flame fusion core. The glass filled materials. Uh, glass filling has just recently become a problem and believe me it is written up in the book. They call it glossing the surface and filling pits and fractures on corundum and that's what it's called in that book. And they were sitting there trying to figure out pulling their hair doing all sorts of chemical analyses on the glass in this material. Uh, uh, trying to figure out exactly what kind of glass it was uh, because a glass even at its best if you're even at its most liquid point if you heat a glass up to where it's boiling it's still like a highly viscous syrup at best I mean it's it's very thick and gooey so how are you going to get a glass to flow into every little nook and cranny evenly without trapping some gas bubbles if you just took a melted glass and dipped the thing in there you're not going to do it there has to be something else there well, this book describes a mixture of a glass that makes a chemical eutectic, an actual chemical bond with corundum. It has an affinity for corundum. So it wants to get into every little nook and cranny that it can find. And when they compared the analyses that they were getting off of this glass with the analysis of, of what this glass was supposed to be in the book, it matched. So that's what they're doing. And this is what it looks like in reflected light. You can see the filled area here. And sometimes these things have occasion to fall out. We've seen stones that look like they've been 40% glass. So if you're not aware of this, you might be paying a high premium price for a glass that's been filled into the material because it does add weight. There's nothing, in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with the treatment as long as it's disclosed because I would rather have a stone with this filling in it than a big cavity that's going to collect dirt. But I would like to know that that, ca that filling is in there because I don't want to be paying a ruby price for a piece of glass. Another one with a filled edge on a girdle. Made a nice improvement on the stone, filled in a cavity on the edge of the girdle that would have collected a lot of dirt. But look at how perfectly that's filled in along there. Every little crack has been filled in. Now this was one of the ones that, that we, we got and we weren't really sure, was this a glass filled cavity, see all the bubbles in here? Or was this a um, natural inclusion that had melted? Because we have seen melted inclusions. In the Ruby lecture I do, you'll see a cavity with three bubbles in it. And it's completely enclosed in the stone, there's no way it's a glass filling. Well, this one was difficult to understand because all the bubbles are concentrated at the opening and even with a chemical eutectic form, it would be virtually impossible to drag a glass in to fill every bit of this cavity. And why would you leave bubbles at the opening like this? The cavitation at the opening like this suggests that this was an inclusion near the surface of the stone that had a much lower melting point than the corundum. When this ruby was heat treated, it exploded, found the closest area at the surface to explode outward. It exploded outward, it was repolished, so you've lost the evidence of drainage, but you get, an, you get instant cavitation when something is a liquid and you relieve pressure. And the cavitation, the flow, the positioning of the bubbles suggests that the flow was out rather than in. And as a proof of this, I'll show you a slide of, of something that's exactly where they forgot to remove the evidence of an outward flow instead of an inward flow. These are little natural inclusions with bubbles in them, natural glass inclusions in Thai rubies. You'll notice that the gas bubble has been cut through so it's a little pit and then the glass has a different reflectance. So those are natural inclusions. Here's another one with two bubbles in it telling you that this is a glass and not an actual loose liquid like we would think of a water because those would be one bubble if it was a water and then there they are together cut through on the surface. But this is the one that shows that there's an outward flow and that, and that inclusions do melt, blow outward and during heat treatment. So everything you see with gas bubbles in it like this isn't necessarily, even though it breaks the surface, isn't necessarily a filled cavity. This is a fairly large inclusion. It's an inclusion of boomite in this case. The bubbles get generally larger toward the surface, which also makes sense because the pressure is less up here than it is down here. So there's a greater expansion of the gases but it broke the surface up in here and they forgot to remove the evidence. So you start to see a flow droplet and this is a glass here. And uh, then we go into complete reflectance and you see where they forgot to repolish and they just left this big droplet here on the surface. So this is obvious flow out and not flow inward. Some other things to look for in the treatment of corundums and manufacturing and whatever else they can do is uh, they take green sapphires, blue-green sapphires that have a really nice silk to the surface of them and so forth and a few little natural inclusions and they piece these together with um, synthetic ruby pavilions and so you've got this if you look quickly at the stone with a loop or something you see all this nice silk in the in the in the top and everything like this and natural inclusions it's got a nice red color you automatically think oh a nice natural ruby but if you look closely at the girdle you'll see that you see a green rind running along the girdle area and that's the green color of the actual cap of this assembled stone the old garnet and glass doublet still is around, still is being made, and they use the garnet. They usually try to pick something with a lot of natural looking inclusions, 
that can possibly be mistaken as a ruby. Some other interesting things that we've encountered. Uh, this is a uh, metal backing on a, on a ruby cabochon, and they've actually etched the metal backing, scratched it into the form of a, of a, a rutile, so you get a light scattering off of it. It produces a pretty good star. Here's one that produced a really weird star, depending on how many lights you used. This was a ruby cabochon over this metal plate, and they'd etched this, but they'd etched it in so many directions, depending on the number of lights you put in there, you would get all sorts of things. And so this, is, this star really went wild. I like to leave people with this thought in regard to treatments, because a lot of the synthetics and treatments and the things that we're seeing now are the direct spin-off from the laser and electro-optics industries. In other words, other sciences are influencing gemology the way they never have before, and a lot of these things are translated into gemstones. And so I leave you with this little silicon chip here, uh, showing you what a microchip looks like and giving you a little food for thought as far as technology goes, because technology is going to continue to advance, and there's nothing that we can really do to stop it, so we have to be prepared for what it may bring to gemology. Thank you.